Welcome to this afternoon session. We'll be talking about memory kinetics. Kinetics studies the rate of change. In the case of memory, we have the application that allocates memory or consumes memory. We have the GC that cleans it up. So um, how the system performs is determined by the relative strength of those rates. My name is Kenny Yu. I don't just watch TV, I direct TV. <laughs> <laughs> That's our slogan. <laughs> so, have you ever had problems with these uh, issues like excessive GC activities? Um, premature attainment, I've had a plenty of this. I was called into situation why the system is hanging. So I took a thread down, look at what's happening, it's running GC 100%, and GC was full. And when I increase the um, heap, it does the same. So we're gonna look at these issues and Toward the end, I will present a prescription to these headaches. The objectives. They sound very simple. High throughput, low pause time, and low cost of GC, very ideal, okay? But they were very vague and uh, abstract, so let's look at something more concrete. Usually, when problem happens, we see the GC cost going up. The total cost of GC is the frequency of GC times cost per GC. Okay. When we increase the load, the frequency increases as well as the cost per GC because you have more um, dead objects to clean up, or possibly uh, that's not the uh, worst case. Maybe you have more live objects, right? So the um, cost of GC as a percentage of CPU increases. So when the curve bends up at certain level of load, the CPU is consumed by GC, you can no longer run your application. So the goal here is to change the red line to the green line. We want to maintain the cost of GC below 10%, and the lower the better, of course. But we, we don't want the line to bend up sharply. Our approach is, is to control generational distribution and managing Eden and survivor spaces to control GC intervals and manage OGen capacity, OC, to minimize OGC. This is a core, this is everything we need to know about kinetics, little so. The capacity is survival rate times hold time a rivalry in this case is how fast the application allocates memory. Whole time is how long those objects live. And the product is how much memory you need. This law applies to not only the whole, the heap as a whole, but the subsystems, Eden, Survivor, and Origin, because the problems can happen in any of those regions. And Little's law is true regardless of the distribution of retention time. If we take the heap as a whole, it's quite interesting that um, it's obvious that we want the objects to live as briefly as possible. That is the whole time. And we can minimize the capacity. When you, to keep this in mind as we go forward. Now, to make sure what we are talking about, we use hotspot. Um, the memory is divided into a few regions. 
Eden Survivor Tenure, or what we call OGC, and Prem and Perm. We are primarily concerned about the first three regions, Eden Survivor and Origin. First, we want to stress the importance of generational hypothesis. We want that to be enforced. In the previous previous slide, we mentioned the hold time. We want the hold time to be as brief as possible. Therefore, we want the most of, sorry. We want most objects to be here, to live very briefly. Inevitably, we have some long-living objects, like the caches, that structural data. We want them to stay forever, but because the population is relatively low, most objects die here, we want this part to be way high. So the average age, that is the whole time in Little's Law, will be brief. To achieve this, at some point, in our case, we did. We redesigned the application to polarize the generational distribution by making the sessions lighter. Um, we make sure the objects don't stay too long. They only stay um, as briefly as possible. Therefore, we, if possible, we put the sessions in requests instead of sessions. And we set up long-living caches for that area. Now, with that in mind, we can move into some numbers. We can measure how much old gene space that's needed as a minimum. To get that, we trigger a 4GC. That will give us, upon the 4GC, we have this old gene size. That will be the minimum size. That is what I call fixed old gene utilization. And the old gene utilization can be divided into two parts. One is fixed, that will not decrease. That's for the uh, structural data and caches. Another is variable. That depends on your load level. The faster you run your application, the variable part increases. So in this case, we measure the uh, fixed part of the old gene to be 1.5 gigabytes. Right? Also, from another GC run, we can measure the rate of allocation in the young gene. This is the young gene. It uh, copied this much objects in 0.3 seconds. So here we can measure the old gene utilization fixed part upon a 4GC to be 1.5 gigabytes, and we measure the survival copy rate, 140 megabytes per second. Those will come in handy when we uh, design the sizes. And from Little's Law, we also know that the old gene capacity minus the fixed part, that is a variable part, if you did divide that by the rate of usage of the old gene, that will give you the 4GC interval. So whenever the uh, old gene is full, it needs to run the 4GC. We want that to be wrong, ideally, once a day. With that information, we can move on to young GC. We want to control how often the young GC runs. If it's too brief, the objects will uh, overflow to origin before they die. If the time is too long, you need a lot of memory and the pause may be longer. To determine young GC interval, we would need to measure the response time. That's a rough estimate of how long your objects live in the young generation. 
to capture most of the objects, we measure the response times without GC at low load, because at low load, GC doesn't run often, so uh, the response times is, are not affected by GC. And I would multiply that by a factor to make sure when the young GC runs, most of the objects in the young gene are dead. So in my case, I said four. Some people suggested studying the um, statistics to make sure over 90% of the um, objects in young gene are dead when you run, um, when you kick off the young GC. So we know how often we need to run a young, G, a young GC. And we know, uh, we need to know how fast application allocates objects in the young gene. With that, we can calculate the capacity of, young, uh, of Eden. To measure that, to measure memory allocation rate on the load, by on the load, um, I mean, you check the uh, CPU utilization. You make sure it's up to reasonable percentage, 30, 50 percent. Then you trigger uh, two rounds of uh, uh, young GC. From this here, we have the starting point. We have that size and starting time. And until the next run, we have a new size, young gene size. Here we got f four gigabytes. And we have another time. So if we take the difference in the memory utilization divided by the difference in time, we see the application allocates 80 megabytes per second. Therefore, we know the young GC frequency. We got that from the response times. We do the multiplication, we know the Eden size needs to be 2.4 gigabytes. That's um, quite sizable uh, Eden. So the seconds. Thirty seconds. That's young GC frequency. That's the time. We figure within thirty seconds, most of the objects in Eden will be dead. So, yeah. so when you mentioned response time in the last slide, would that be application? Application response time. Like serving a web request. Serving a exactly. So um, most of the objects are used by the request. You send a request, you send some response. During that time period, the objects should have been dead. That's how long they live, right. the rough estimate. So we know the uh, Eden size. Now we move on to uh, survival size. To measure the actual utilization of survival size. We use that to determine, um, to fix the uh, size of survival space. To do that, we manually set the survival size to be very large, very, very oversized, basically. And you watch what size is being used, the actual utilization of survival. And you set your survival capacity to be twice the maximum survival utilization. Um, in our case, we figure that will be 200 megabytes. As to how to measure this, you'll see in the following slides. Uh, let me jump a bit. Uh, I use just that to measure Survival size, capacity, and survival utilization. You see, survival utilization, the change, the change, the jump to here, when copy from uh, S1 to S0, so I figure that's like 50 megabytes right there. So, yeah, that's how I, I measure uh, survival utilization. 
Yeah, anyway, we may just survive with utilization. Now, we come to two key relationships. Even utilization is proportional to the load. The more load you put on it, the more even size you use because we fix the uh, frequency, Young GC frequency. Similarly, the more load you put on the system, the more survivor utilization, right? These two are important because they're both proportional to the load response per second. If we take the ratio, they should be constant to the application. Therefore, survival ratio is independent of workload because the uh, Eden and survival are both are proportional to the workload. You take the ratio, the workload is canceled out. So survival ratio is a property of the application. Um, no matter where you run the application, how many CPUs you have on different hardware, survival ratio should be kept constant. Now it will come handy, it will be important in our design of uh, scale-up and optimization. In our case, we figure, either needs to be this much, survival needs to be this much, the ratio needs to be 12. To be more uh, conservative, you, you can keep it smaller, 12 to 10, to make sure survival is never full. Um, in my experience, if the survival is too small, or if you let the JVM adaptively set the survival size, usually that size is too small. When that is too small, when you ramp up the load, um, the objects are prematurely promoted to origin. Uh, in some cases, I saw survival utilization to be zero because it's not enough for the copying. So the um, objects go straight from in to the uh, old gene, and the old gene gets filled up very quickly. All the CPUs are running GC, for GC. Oh, by the way, for GC or the GC in the uh, old generation is very slow. Okay, now we figure out Eden size survival size and survival ratio. Now we look at the origin. Um, how much size do we give it? And what behaviors do we expect? We could measure the overflow rate on the load. That is how fast origin utilization grows. Here, for example, we uh, get a number every 10 seconds. Using JSTAC, we fetch the numbers every 10 seconds. In five rounds, we watch origin utilization. Because the first few digits are the same, we just look at the red numbers toward the end. In our case, the promotion rate is change of origin utilization divided by the time, in this case 50 seconds, we get the pr promotion rate. With that, we can determine origin capacity. We have a wish. We want that origin interval to be long. We don't need to run, we don't want the um, 4GC to run too often. Um, but in the night, we'll refresh the caches, we'll do other kind of uh, cron jobs, so you can't really prevent for GC to run in the night, so it, it's fine to let it run in the night. So we can set the origin capacity to be the fix plus the a spare. The fix is what we measured previously by triggering a 4GC, and the spare is the promotion rate times the interval, how often you want it to run. Here's the prescription for the um, 
memory headaches. Our goal is to design all the sizes and frequencies of G sizes of the regions and the frequencies of GC run. Upon 4GC, we measure the fixed old gene neutralization. And we use that as a basis for old gene capacity. We increase the load, use the response times to determine young GC interval or on the load load. Yeah. We increase the load to measure the memory allocation rate. Given that interval, we can calculate the Eden size. Then we oversize the survivor to measure the survivor utilization. With that, compared to the uh, Eden size, we get the survivor ratio. With load and Eden capacity, survivor capacity, we can measure promotion rate. With that, we determine the 4GC interval and the size of OG. So we have a prescription based on the kinetics, the rate of allocation and rate of reclamation. We design the GC behavior. The final configuration goes like this. We fix the um, survival ratio, and we want to disable the adaptive survival size policy. Because uh, adaptive size, as I pointed out earlier, is not that meaningful because it changes survival ratio while we conclude that the survival ratio should be kept constant for the same application. And we use uh, CMS for the old gene, parallel for the uh, young gene, and we control how often, at what condition, on this GC's run, and we give it um, the heap, total heap and young generation size. <coughs> For scale up, now we have our, we got the basics. For scale up to faster and more G uh, CPUs, that is also optimization under different hardware conditions, certain things we need to keep constant. That is, fixed origin utilization that we can measure, and survival ratio. Other factors are CPU dependent. That's young, gene, um, young GC interval that depends on the CPU power. That comes from the measurement of response time. Other factors need to be adaptive. In fact, need to be proportional to CPU and throughput. That is, how fast the CPU runs, how many cores you have, and how much load you plan to put on the system. Those will determine the Eden size and spare origin size. So, in the end, we report the performance results. As designed, we want the 4GC to run once at night. So in the day, we don't want the 4GC to run. We were quite lucky to realize that um, because we uh, refactored the application such that um, most of the objects die in Eden and survive. Yeah because we said the survival space to be quite large, so within 31 um, GC runs, they'll be dead. Um, memory problems solved, the system is stable. GC pauses um, for about 50 milliseconds. The application becomes CPU bound. This needs some explanation how we are sure about that. 
because we designed the um, even size at 50% CPU utilization. And if we double even size, then even if you put on double the load, that is, even if the application runs at 100% CPU, the GC will not be busy. Therefore, we realize, we made sure that um, GC is not an issue. The relative cost of GC as a percentage of CPU utilization is below 10%. And response times is stable. Um, outliers are eliminated. I uh, thank my colleagues for help. Um, to get to these numbers, we had people running load runner, you know, um, configuring the system, uh, OS and web logic for large pages usages. And thank you for coming. And I'll be glad to entertain your questions. Well, it depends on where the memory is used. If it uses heap memory, it's still here. Right, if it doesn't use heap memory, we cannot control that. You could. You can study the allocation detail with some profiling tools, um, but that will make things much more complicated than uh, studying the heap. So, uh, to her, to add her point, I mean, things like uh, Starka, Edge Cache, or uh, some of those components, I mean, they all actually sit in hard cache within the JVM itself. So, I mean, what kind of profile tools would we need? Cache is actually staying in the heap. Yeah, so what, what kind of tools could we have to use to analyze the impact of that application or, or that library on our application? Uh, I've used your kit profile, uh, but for your purpose, I'm not sure that's needed because you, you, you know the uh, life cycle of the caches, right? You set it up, it's in the configuration file. So you have some idea how long they live. So you can estimate their impact on the origin. Caches stay pretty long. You want them to stay long, and um, you know they live in origin. I'm sorry. Uh, you need to do similar studies with each release. You need to study the kinetics, uh, how fast the application allocates memory. How's that integrated with your build cycle, for your release cycle? At what point do you start your development drops? Or do you development drops. Uh, we have the test system set up in development. So we have fairly different machines in development. So. We can run the, such analysis often. So I thought that over time it might be very interesting to understand memory allocation rate for, for many purposes. Do you know of any tools or statistics that to break it down by thread uh, in, in production, how many megabytes each thread is allocated so far? It feels like that would be a, a cheap thing for the VM to be able to collect with no overhead. Uh, I don't know if there are any tools to get it to you. You could. Um, there are tools for um, recording allocation and the sizes, but they are very intrusive. They change the application profile. And also, in the case of web application, they, um, 
each thread pretty much behaves similarly. Right. So you can just do the average. Well, the closest thing I did was to study uh, one type of request at a time, I if the requests are not homogeneous. Yeah, and then I get some idea about the average. Yeah. Yeah, and then I tune for certain uh, problematic uh, requests. <laughs> yeah, he's asking about is there any easier way than reading the GC log with your eyes? <laughs> um, as I got familiar with the GC log, I found it quite convenient just to read it. <laughs> I use some tools that draw the lines before and GC, after GC. This. The application I study is the, uh, um, the business application. Is whenever you go to the website, when uh, partners call us, uh, when people complain, they run our application. <laughs> We can't make it longer, because in the night we have refreshes. Um, in the night we um, add new rules, and new models, <coughs> prices, products, channels. So we expect something will happen in the night. So we cannot make the, the interval longer than 24 hours. So, so have a form of yes. Yeah, potentially, yeah. So we figure in the night we could um, um, rotate the servers to to refresh. So um, 24 hours. It's a good idea. Yeah, uh, it didn't work well for me. <laughs> uh, you see, even um, CMS and Pyro new didn't work quite well. That's why. We are manually setting all these um, parameters and disabling the ergo as the adaptive policies. Yeah, because the default survival size by those systems are quite um, large. That is, the, size, the survival size was too small. And the Eden size was too small. The default allocation is a huge old gene, small young gene. That doesn't fit our need. That's right. Depends on how long they live. Uh, as per Little's law, the um, shorter those things live, the better. Or if they have to live very long, they have to be very few. Otherwise, you'll be in trouble. So um, you want to make sure either they live very long, much, much longer than 31, that's the maximum uh, generation, before they get promoted, yeah. um, or very briefly. 
Um, if you have caches that live for, say, one hour or two, uh, that you cannot clean them up in Eden or Yangjin, they have to be promoted, and then you have to run more often OGC. There's no way around that. Well, the way you set up uh, um, concurrent uh, mark and sweep will help. So uh, you want those medium term objects to be managed by the um, concurrent threads. It's only possible if you don't have uh, the problem he raised. That is, you have an object, caching objects that I live for like one hour. And then probably, with his problem, probably you have to run the 4GC in a day. Yeah, that would. Now it would cause problems. Another thing is uh, uh, we use uh, EH cache. It is how long the objects live. The time to live and time to idle. Those parameters are the key. Yeah. Uh, one six. One six. Uh, obviously, it's 64 bit. So you can use 7, 8 gigs of memory. Are you going to have slides on slide share? Yes, I give my slides to that gentleman. So he'll probably upload it. Yeah. It'll be, they'll be available. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Any more questions?